Thank you for having me. So, um, obligatory small presentation about who I am. I'm a data engineer or Python developer or whatever I decide to call it at the day at the Netherlands Forensic Institute, which is a uh, public uh, institute doing forensic research and casework in the Netherlands. Um, we use a lot of Python in our day-to-day -day, uh, jobs, which is why we attend EuroPython every once in a while. Um, we use it for wrangling data, training or applying AI things, um, and uh, we discuss a lot of Python at work, at the coffee machine or, or wherever, which actually prompted this talk. Um, funny enough, this talk is not about any of our work. Um, if you really are interested in what we do in the Forensic Institute, um, please check out the talk my colleague gave last year about threat to life preventing plant murders with Python. It's on YouTube, so feel free to check that out. Um, we have a GitHub called the Netherlands Forensic Institute, and we also have a uh, hugging face if you're interested in that. Um, but today is not going to be about forensics at all. Um, so when I wrote this abstract, um, I figured typing annotations or annotations in general have become so synonymous with typing, um, and they don't really need to be. So what are the use cases for doing anything other than typing with these things? Is that even useful? Should you care about this? And maybe should you even stop using typing? I know it's worded a bit extreme, so maybe get to that at, uh, uh, first in case you joined here with pitchforks. Um, no, you should not stop using typing. Um, typing is one of the main and the best well-known use case for annotations in Python. So. If you like using typing, uh, typing, just keep using it. It is great, it serves a purpose, and it's there for you to use. So, what are we talking about? What are annotations? And I'm guessing most of you will already know what annotations are, um, but just as a small recap, um, it's a very small bit of Python, and you can see here, I'm assuming my mouse, yes, that shows up on screen. Um, the things behind the columns and before the equal sign are the annotations. If you come from other languages than, uh, than Python, you might re think these things are annotations. If you come from Java, they look just like annotations in Java. In Python, they are just the things that are, um, in this case, annotated as types. So the bytes, the integer, and the float. So typing, right? So I showed you what annotations are. They are typing. Um, and to go back to exactly what annotations are, we have to jump back quite a few years. The slides, I'm not sure if that's legible. Uh, but this is a PEP Python announcement proposal from 2006, um, documenting the addition of function annotations. Um, and uh, because it says Python version 3.0, these things are effectively new to Python 3.0. This is 18 years ago. So they've been around for quite a long time. Now, we all know the typing module. And the typing module, if you look at the slide, clearly says, wait, this was added in Python 3.5. So there's a bit of a discrepancy there. Like, it was introduced in Python 3.0, but the typing module is only as old as 3.5. So there must have been reasons or ways to use these things that are not typing, even though, obviously, the types like bytes, ints, floats were already around at the time uh, of introducing that PEP. So um, what else? What else can we do with uh, this beautiful syntactic thing? Consider the following algorithm. I was just browsing Wikipedia, um, and this is just a mathematical algorithm providing a signature to a message called uh, a Schnorr signature. Uh, I basically picked this because it sounds funny. Um, in Dutch, a Schnorr is basically a mustache. Uh, I didn't come here to make fun of people's names, but um, still, it made me grin, so I chose this one. Um, so if we read mathematically what this algorithm is supposed to do, um, there is more to this uh, definition, but feel free to check out Wikipedia if you want to. Um, we start off with a message. And this message is called capital M. Um, we'll choose a random K from the allowed set, and that's defined above. Uh, it doesn't really matter. You don't really need to understand this algorithm for uh, this talk, don't worry. Um, and then we compute some R. Uh, we compute an E using a, uh, a function called H. And that just feeds R and M into that function. And 
we compute something called S by simple addition and multiplication. And then the signature pair at the end is um, a combination of two letters. Amazing. So that's not really hard to translate into Python. If you just look at the uh, mathematical definition, we can just copy the function name. We'll create a Schnorr signature, or, well, I like to say we'll create a Schnorr. Um, using M and X, um, we'll compute E, we'll compute S, and we'll return S and A. Now, being a Python developer, um, this, this kind of hurts my eyes. Um, it, it fits on the slide, it's very, very concise. Python is very concise, very powerful, so this is all fine. And Python will be fine by this, actually, so it doesn't really matter. But, um, and also, this is uh, a signature about uh, math, math and uh, crypto cryptography, so please do not assume or use this, this as something correct. This is only an example. So don't use the code in this slide for anything other than demonstrative purposes. Um, so mathematicians are weird. They like to use single letter symbols for things, um, and they like to keep using them, and they like to write things as concise as they can be. Um, but Pythonistas know better, because we have the Zen of Python, and one of the fam most famous lines in the Zen of Python reads, readability counts. And as a Python developer, I would say this, while concise, is not very readable, because I have no idea what all of these letters mean. Um, I'm deliberately not going back to the definition uh, a slide back, so I'm hoping most of you will have forgotten what, it, what M and X actually are. So, um, this is, this is fixable. Um, we as Python developers will we'll just rename all the variables so they start making sense again. So the capital letter M is just a message, and that X in the, uh, in the function definition um, was the private key. And then at some point, we compute two halves of a signature and return those two halves of the signature. Again, you don't really know to need to know exactly how this works or why the uh, plus and uh, multiplication signs actually work on these things. Um, but this, to me, is more readable because now the variables actually say what I think they should mean. So, obviously, typing will improve this, right? Because, oh, well, annotations and typing, they are basically synonymous. Typing will improve this. Um, well, so the message we get, this is basically just bytes. It's a binary message. We can sign a binary message, it's a bytes. That private key, it's math and it's cryptography, so you bet you it's gonna be an integer. It's just an integer. And what we return is a tuple of bytes. Um, there's nothing wrong about this. This is, not, this is no lie, and uh, both the Python interpreter and the type checker will be fine by this. A message is bytes, a private key is an integer. Um, and it returns a tuple of bytes. I'm not really so sure this is all that much better. Um, it's, yeah, it's not wrong, uh, but it doesn't really give me a whole lot of information. I already knew my message was bytes, because, yeah, what else is it going to be? Um, and in reality, the only integer in that algorithm might be a bytes as well, because in cryptography, numbers tend to get ridiculously large, so people tend to store them as bytes rather than integers. <coughs> Python, of course, doesn't really care. You can make an integer as big as you want. So mathematically, we have an integer here. Um, but these type annotations don't really give us a whole lot of information. So I implemented this. Along comes a reviewer. And a colleague of mine is actually much more uh, fluent in math and uh, cryptography than I am. So I had them review the algorithm. Um, and they know the algorithm, so that's nice. And they come back, yeah, it seems all right. I think the implementation is correct. Um, but it's a bit hard to read without the, all the original symbols. <laughs> Gosh darn it. And I just translated it to get rid of those one single sim uh, symbols. So what if you use annotations for this? So forget the typing for now. Go back to our original algorithm and see if we can make this readable for a mathematician. So if we drop the bytes and the integers, and we put back these uh, single letters in, in the place where usually the type annotations go, suddenly we get both worlds. So now we have a Python implementation with arguments that make sense to me, make sense to you, I hope, um, and also make sense to our mathematician that know the actual algorithm. So my linter is a lot happier because 
single, sing single letter variable names are um, work of the devil, don't use those. But my developer is a lot happier, my developer being me, because I can read and I can know exactly what I've been doing. And also the reviewer is happier, because the reviewer was usually um, familiar with the mathematical approach to this, to this and not really the Pythonic approach to this. And now we have both math and Python domains represented in the same bit of code. So this is my first example of using annotations for anything other than typing. Um, this is effectively used the annotations for documentation. Um, and of course, um, you could put documentation where documentation usually goes, in the doc string. Um, but I would say the same thing goes effectively for typing. Pre-Python 3.0, and I know that's quite a long time ago, um, but typing information used to go in the doc strings. If you wanted to know what a kind of a, a type something was, you could just look it up in the doc string. Um, and the same thing goes for uh, these kinds of uh, annotations. I could have put them in the doc string, but right now they're so close to what they, are, what they represent that it makes it, for some people, easier to read. So that makes sense. What else can we do with um, uh, annotations if we uh, temporarily forget that it's used for typing? We could guard function inputs. So lots of functions, um, at their start, they have to validate inputs that someone else, so the caller, um, has given them. So for a Schnorr signature, um, I kind of made up these uh, requirements. So again, please don't use this in production. Um, but let's say that ma message has a maximum size, otherwise the signature is not going to work. Um, and the length of the message has to be a multiple of 16. And otherwise, yeah, you can't use this method, so I'll raise a value error if you don't confine to um, the requirements for those inputs. You can't use this function, you're gonna get an exception. Um, so how about we just annotate what's valid? So all those functions, it happens quite a lot, um, 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 lines and lines of uh, parameter validation before actually doing anything useful in the code. Um, can we use function annotations for something like this? Well, I think we can. So binary is not something that is available in the standard library, so I made that up. Um, also, the presentation doesn't really have an actual implementation of this. So, But let's um, assume that binary is some kind of a function. Uh, the return value of this would say, well, any bytes that is longer than four kilobytes, you're going to get a value error. And if that bytes um, length is not a multiple of 16, you're going to get a value error. And while we're at it, we're also annotating the private key, because we know from the definition of the algorithm that private key must be a number in the domain Z with a maximum value of Q that's been defined for the algorithm. Um, so now we've annotated what these parameters are supposed to be um, right at the place where they are defined. The problem is there is no magic hook to actually do this validation. At this point, it's no more than just documentation of what I expect from these arguments. Um, and you probably know, or should know, that the Python interpreter um, blindly ignores all of these annotations. The annotations are aimed at you, the reader, or you, the writer. The interpreter isn't gonna, is not going to ignore them at, uh, um, um, uh, at all. So, um, if you're going to have to do, uh, if you're going to have to use one of these annotations, you're going to have to get at them. So if only Python had a way to neatly wrap a piece of code with some other piece of code that could do the validation for us. Well, that's called a decorator. Uh, decorators can be quite complex to make, but it does exactly what it says on the tin. It decorates a function with something else. So um, there's a bunch of to-dos here in the code, so I didn't actually implement the, uh, the thing here. Um, but what you could do is um, retrieve the annotations from your function, and then at runtime, when that function gets called, match those arguments to what you have stated the, the requirements are, validate those guards um, with the values they've provided, and maybe even validate the results while we're at them, because um, return annotation can be used as well. Um, and then we return this wrapped function. If you're unfamiliar with decorators, look them up in the documentation, they're really quite powerful. But it ends up looking something like this. So these are the same annotations on the same parameters we had before. Um, so we have a binary argument of max length and a multiple of 16. 
but that guard annotator provides the hook we so desperately needed. So even if the interpreter is still ignoring all of these annotations um, we're feeding it, um, the, the guard decorator will at some point catch that because we've told the function to be wrapped with that guarding decorator. And it will raise a value error for us if it's incorrect. So in this time, we've used annotations as a runtime requirement. Even though the interpreter will not do anything for us, we, and with our code, have instructed the runtime to validate this for us. So we can use those annotations um, to put those requirements um, and use them at runtime. So um, another place where annotations might at some point be useful. Um, anybody know struct? Python, yeah, library, yeah. Struct is pretty cool. Um, so I guess most people will know a data class, and this might look very weird, because this is a data class without type annotations. And data classes, um, they actually require something uh, at the right-hand side of that colon, and it, that might be um, legal to put an equal sign there. Um, but if you drop everything, including the colon, it will actually be, actually be a syntax error. So we're required to put something there, but we are not required to put typing there if we don't really want to. So if you know struct, um, a, a capital H is an unsigned 16-bit integer, um, a B is just a byte, and 16S will give us 16 bytes. Um, this isn't really implemented at all. Um, but you could use these annotations as uh, letters in the struct library to parse these things from a binary message um, into length, into next header, into a hop limit. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with what a IPv6 packet looks like, but you might say I've uh, skipped the first 32 bits uh, of this thing, sadly, and um, I have because they're they contain values that don't really fit into struct. But just as an example, you could use um, this place where annotations go uh, as a way of defining something that you can read from a struct and then turn into a data class. Um, and in a way, obviously, this is typing information because a capital letter H and a capital letter B, they will both be integers. So I could have said integer here, but that's for struct, not enough information to, uh, to parse this. So this is yet another, just an example of um, where we can use annotations even if they're not really typing the way we're used to. So compatibility with the typing module um, can be complicated. Um, in this presentation, I've put all kinds of stuff in places where you'd usually put types. Um, and then running MyPy, I'm guessing MyPy is gonna shout at you. Uh, MyPy is gonna be very unhappy about what this thing is. So it's hard to make it um, compatible. There is a potential with the guard example because um, because it's running uh, our own code. Um, there is such a thing is that we can check if we are at some point running type checking. Um, so if we are t type checking, maybe that decorator could be turned into a no-op so MyPy can read the original function definition and all of those guards that we made, uh, the binary one could just return bytes if we happen to be type checking to make my, uh, MyPy happy. Um, but that's a bit of a mess. Um, the, the type checking uh, makes it um, so we can uh, do something funny with it, but it makes it complicated to, uh, uh, to actually run a runtime. But it doesn't really have to be such of a mess. Um, small shout out to my new German friend at the speaker's dinner who uh, uh, noted this. Um, there is in the standard library a thing called typing.annotated which serves this exact purpose. So we could annotate our uh, Schnorr function uh, with something like both a type and the thing we set out to, uh, to document for our reviewer friend. Um, and it looks like this. Um, and this combines typing with what we started off with, literally any expression in the Python language. So this sort of serves the dual purpose of combining um, our newfangled uh, things to do with annotations with the original annotation being the typing. Um, it does require that your anything to put there um, expects this to be a typing.annotated, or rather inspect it, because that's one of the ways you can read the annotations at runtime. Um, so it does put a requirement on the way you implement this. 
um, but it's possible. So the takeaways for this talk are effectively annotations are just Python. They can be any expression you want in the Python language. Um, as long as it returns a value, the interpreter will store it for you and you can uh, do whatever you want with the annotations. So any expression will do. Any valid Python expression will just work in the place of an annotation. Um, not all of them will make sense. Um, I've tried to come up with some examples that to me, or hopefully to you, do make sense. Um, but as is any expression, you could annotate your favorite parameters with your favorite emoji, and it'll be all fun and games, but um, they might not make a whole lot of sense to whoever reads that code. And the interpreter will, will ignore them at runtime unless you hook into it with something else. So feel free to do anything with it, but don't expect anything Python will do for you. So I'm hoping that um, this presentation has given you an idea of there is more than typing um, in the uh, Python language expression, um, but, but only if you really want there to be. So that's all I had to tell to you today. Um, thank you very much for your uh, attention. If you want, find the slides on GitHub, and um, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for your presentation, Matthew. So if ha you have any questions, please go to the mic. It was remarkably clear or very unclear. So I'm going off a distant memory here, but when typing was introduced, I think it was supposed to be kind of universal and used for lots of things. And I think there's now a PEP which says that typing is now only, sorry, annotations are only now for typing and any other use is considered a misuse. I could be misremembering this. But I think typing is you know, increasingly opinionated that only, it, only it's the one true owner of your annotations. I don't know what the question is, but um. uh, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not. Uh, uh, I'm not sure of all of the PEPs that are currently under consideration. So um, you might even be right. Um, I think it would make me slightly sad because I think it's a very cool feature uh, that Python allows you to do this. So um, I, I don't know. It could be, and um, maybe for some people uh, that will make the language better. Yeah, it would make me sad too. But thank you. <laughs> So I think uh, people must work with people not from Python world, and I saw a lot of code, code snips there. Just looks like a, maybe very hard for others to understand if they are not from Python world. What's your check on these? Uh, like, like the examples of using the result of a function call as an annotation, maybe? I think so. Just a lot of code, like people outside of the Python world may be very unfamiliar with and feel very just not so sure like that your tech of this kind of approach is actually makes things better, review or really feel better, especially if they are not from the Python con. Uh, yeah, I think that's background. a valid concern. So um, as a Python developer, we should always be aware that code is often write once, read many, and we have no control over who's going to read it. So um, if someone expresses concern over whether this is readable or makes sense or uh, they can even understand it, that would be a great reason to uh, use it for something else. Does that answer your question? Yes, I <laughs> think so. OK, thanks. Any more questions? OK, thank you so much, Matthias, Matthias Eugen. <laughs> We have lunch, so let's go to eat.